Good morning, Christian Life Center. Can you guys stand up on your feet? Before we begin, we just want to say a special happy Father's Day to all the fathers. So can you guys just put your hands together? We're so thankful. Hallelujah. And then today we get the honor and the privilege to worship the Father of Fathers, and that is God up in heaven. Are you guys ready to worship him today? If you're ready, can somebody shout hallelujah? So put those hands together like this. There's no one like you, Lord. We're so thankful for your love. We're so thankful for your love. is more than enough. Lord, that's, that's why we've come here, to raise our hands and worship him because of his love. There's no love like the love of the Father. There's no love like the love of the Father. So if you believe in that, 
Can you just raise your hands in the air as we continue to sing about his love that's never ending, that relentlessly pursues us. Just in your own way, can you just worship him right now all over this room? It's nothing like your love. There's nothing like your love. Can you guys just sing that over your lives? Sing. There's nothing like your love. There's nothing like your love. There's nothing like your love. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me. your life in me and you have been so so kind to me
snow mountain you won't climb up, shadow you won't light up, coming after me. The snow wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't. There's no wall. Listen, I don't know. There may be some people in this room who don't understand the true love of God. This is a love like none other. This is a love that you can't find anywhere. This is a love that is everlasting. It is a love that is relentlessly pursuing you and I. So we're gonna sing that part again, but I need you to sing it like you mean it. I don't know if you have to raise your hands or if you have to shout it out or scream it from the depths of your soul, but this is a faith declaration that says, it doesn't matter what the person to my left says, it doesn't matter what my life looks like, the one thing I can lean on is that the love of God is always pursuing me. And this is why I raise my hands and worship him. Sing, there's no shadow, there's no shadow you won't light up. Come on, church, the play. Just raise your hands and sing that. Sing, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. I'm loved by you. Sing, you're a good, good father. Say, Church, I say you are 
Can everyone just put their hands on their heart as you sing that? You're a good, good father. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. Father, that's who we are today. We are children of the Most High God. We are loved by you. Your word says that for you love the world so much that you gave your only son so that we would not perish and have everlasting life. So Father, take our worship as a response that says, I love you too. I love you too, Jesus. I love you too, God. You deserve it all. And all of God's people said, amen. You guys may be seated as we continue to worship.
so that we would have everlasting life in you. We thank you for sending your son, Lord, to demonstrate to us the greatest picture of love. God, we thank you for seeing our lives and saying, man, we are worth fighting for. We're worth you sacrificing your one and only son. My prayer, Lord, is that every person in this room would receive the revelation of a good, good father who would send down his son to die for us. God, I pray that would be, become such a real thing for us today. And in response, Lord, that we would take our, our, our faith and our families and everything that we're standing for to say, Lord, those things are worth fighting for as well. We need your strength. So, Father, as we continue on in the service, be glorified in a powerful way, Lord. We pray this. We believe this in Jesus' name. Can someone say amen? Can you give him praise just one more time as we continue in the service? Well, welcome to Christian Life Center. I'm Pastor Kevin, one of our pastors here. I'm so happy to see all of you in the house of the Lord. Also want to welcome those of you who are joining through live stream. Here at Christian Life Center, we believe we are called to experience God, to connect, to grow, serve, and impact our world. We believe that we are carrying a message of hope, and our prayers that it would take that message of hope everywhere we go to, everyone we meet. At this time, can everybody go ahead and grab your bulletins and grab the connection card inside of it at this time? Everyone in the room. If you're visiting here for the first time, can you just give me a wave so we can acknowledge you and just thank you for joining us today? Let's go ahead and welcome them and thank them for joining us. To show our appreciation of you being here, we have some information that we'd like to give to you. Also, we have a free gift that we'd like to personally give to you as well. If you're interested in receiving some information as well as that free gift, that connection card that I just mentioned a moment ago, if you would grab that and print your name and information on it completely, entirely, and there's a box on there you can check that says first time guest. Go ahead and check that box. And at the end of the service, head out of the double doors, head to the right. There's an open area called the Connection Center. There will be some leaders there to greet you and answer any questions you may have pertaining to Christian Life Center, some ushers as well. And if you, and um, in exchange for that information, or excuse me, that connection card you're filling out this time, we'll be able to give you some information about our church as well as that free gift that I mentioned. If you do not have a home church, we ask that you would prayerfully consider making Christian Life Center your home church. We have plenty of room for you and your family. So I want to just let you know, welcome home. Amen. Those of you who are regular attenders and members, print your first and last name on the connection card at this time. Just letting us know that you're joining us today. And if there's any changes in your contact information, please make those changes accordingly so that we have the best way of contacting you here and letting you know what's going on here at Christian Life Center. Once again, I welcome every person uh, to Christian Life Center today. Just some quick announcements just before we move forward. First of all, it is Father's Day. How many people are just grateful for Father's Day? In honor of that, we have something we call Donuts with Dads that's taking place in the Family Life Center next door. You'll be able to head over there, and there's some, some tables set up for you to be able to grab some donuts and take some pictures with your family. Just to be able to just uh, have a, a good family time just honoring our fathers today. Also, in light of Father's Day, we also have a 1958 Corvette that belongs to Ben's, actually. Just kidding, it doesn't belong to Ben's. But outside of the nursery area, you can be able to step out there and get a picture and be able to just have some, uh, just some memories today. Um, please, please, please stop by. Don't rush out at the end of service. Stop by the lobby. Take some pictures with your family. We want to give you an opportunity just to honor your dads or those who you uh, esteem as your, uh, maybe a father figure or maybe a grandparent or whatnot. But please, please stop by and get some pictures out there in the lobby. Uh, last but not least, we still have devotionals in the lobby. Um, if you haven't picked one up yet, we still have them available for you to be able to 
able to uh, purchase one of those in the lobby. If you already have one and perhaps you want to get one for maybe your coworkers or maybe some family members, feel, please feel free to do so. Um, in that devotional, there is always a word for the day, and that word is always on time. So please grab that devotional and be able to hold on to it and be able to meditate on it. Um, daily. Now at this time, those of you who are regular attenders and members, if you would grab your connection card and go ahead and pass them down to the end of your row, the ushers will come down and grab those. But those of you who are first time guests, hold on to that connection card to the end of the service so that you can head to the, lob or the connection center to be able to get that information and that free gift that I mentioned to you just a moment ago. Now at this time, can we all stand to our feet? Why don't you go ahead and greet some people around you in 90 seconds and let them know you are happy to see them in the house of the Lord. red carpet team will come forward at this time is the time that we get to participate in another aspect of worship called tithes and offering where we just get to give unto the Lord on your way in you would have seen some young people that are standing alongside some from our red carpet team we just believe in um, raising up the next generation of giants for the kingdom of God to serve in the house of God and so when you see them, just give them an attaboy. Congrat tell them that how much you appreciate what they're doing, their service unto the Lord, right? We want to instill that in our young people from this age. And you're going to see one of them on the platform in a few, so I want your hearts to be open to that. But as the red carpet team is here to um, collect the uh, tithe, God's tithe and our offering, I want us to be reminded of John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 5. This is Jesus um, in Cana at the wedding of Cana, um, he is there to enjoy a wedding. And we know the text says that they run out of wine. Jesus had not um, um, done a miracle in his public ministry at this time. But here's an opportunity because they ran out of wine. And Jesus' mother, earthly mother Mary, came to Jesus and begins to tell him that they were out of wine. He's a little reluctant because his time, he said, had not yet come. But there was a need. There was a need. And this is what Jesus d does. He comes and he fills the needs that are represented in our lives, that comes and surfaces in our lives. And so he did something. He asked them to fill the buckets that had wine. He asked them to fill it with water. They looked a little hesitant, perplexed. Why would we fill it with water if we're looking for wine? Go get us wine. But Jesus says, fill it with water. And they weren't moving. And Mary said something in the New Testament that I believe is the five most important words of obedience in the entire New Testament to me. And she looks at these individuals that weren't moving when Jesus said to fill the buckets with water. And she says to them, do whatever he tells you. Whatever the master tells you, just do it. I wish um, Nike didn't coin that because really, really and truly, that was Jesus' words. Just do it. And I believe if Mary was here today, she would tell us the same thing. That whatever the master tells us to do, we ought to 
just do it. Because he knows what he wants to bring forth on the other side of our obedience. And so to, right now, you may have your offering in your hand, whether you gave online. For those of you that are watching by way of live stream, you gave online through your give button on the website there. Or whether some of you have texted it in, there's a number on the screen, or given by cash or check. Listen, it is not the method, but the posture of the heart. The posture must always be a posture of obedience. Whatever he tells you, just do it. And so as you hold your offering in your hand, I want you to have that posture. The posture that says, Lord, all that I have belongs to you. I give you out of sacrifice. I give you out of obedience. I give it unto you, not out of re re religiosity or religious duty or because I have to. I give from a heart of devotion unto you. And so do you just hold that offering in your hand, your tithe, your kingdom builder. And I want to pray a prayer of blessing. By the way, out of their lack, they brought water. And Jesus gave the first miracle. Because of their obedience, he turned water into wine. I pray that your offering will be turned into a multitude exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask, think, or imagine. Father, as we hold these offering in our hands, tithe, kingdom builders, whether we're given online, those that are watching by way of live stream, those that are in this house, wherever they are, Lord God, and however they're given, I pray, Lord God, that all of us will have a posture of obedience. That, Lord, because your word says it, we will do as your word says we will walk in obedience unto your word. And we know that on the other side of our obedience, Lord God, is your blessings. Because you bless those that are obedient unto you. So would you open up the floodgates now over those that are given, maybe their students, single parents, households, businessmen, businesswomen, those that are probably in a drought, but they're given out of obedience. Would you open up the floodgates, Lord God, and pour out blessings. Pour out with exceeding measure. I pray with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, would be poured back into their gift, Lord God. In Jesus' name. God's people believe that and said, amen. Listen, we have a young man. He placed first. Ushers, um, red carpet team, you can go forward. I want to introduce Garen to you. He placed first in our, uh, um, um, the kids go away and they have fine arts. And this young man has been using his talents as unto the Lord. And he placed first in our district among hundreds of churches. It came out of CLC. Would you open your hearts and welcome Garen as he plays for us.
Good, good evening, morning. Um, my name is Kanata Small, and I'm hosting the Tonight Show today. Uh, and uh, today is Sunday. How's everyone doing? All right. Um, usually on Sundays, I go to church, and I go home and hit that afternoon nap. And then I start writing uh, my weekly thank you notes. Um, what I wanted to find out is, do you guys mind if I you know, write some of those notes with you here this morning? OK, one more time. <laughs> Studio audience, I need you to give me some participation. Do you mind if I get started on my weekly thank you notes this morning? Yeah. All right, <laughs> that's great. I mean, it is, uh, it is Father's Day, and uh, you know, I got a lot of people to thank, so. Um, Chris, if you don't mind, can you give me some thank you note writing music? Specifically, thank you note writing music. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, son, for being so smart, the way you shouted out. He ran the red light when the nice police officer asked, Sir, do you know why I pulled you over? I mean, at least he knows his colors, right? The light was really, really red. Thank you, kids. Love those kids. Thank you for throwing a huge fit in the middle of the toy aisle. $106 later. Listen, I told your mother she shouldn't have left you or left me alone with you guys. Her bad. Donuts, yes. Thank you. Christian Life Center for giving out donuts today. That's exactly what my daddy body needed. More donuts. <laughs> I got you. I got you. You can smile. Thank you, honey, love of my life, mother of my children, for appreciating me on this special day. But let me ask you something. Uh, what happened to the other 364 days? <laughs> I mean, am I right, man? Am I right? <laughs> Thank you, McDonald's, Wendy's, ooh, Taco Bell, for being oh so delicious, especially when my wife's cooking isn't. Um, she's in the service, isn't she? It's, it's for jokes, babe, it's just for jokes, to make everyone laugh. I'm gonna pay for that one later. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting. Okay. Thank you, kids, both of you guys. The reasons why I celebrate today. Your mom and I had a real good life before you guys came along. How long before you guys turn 18? Thank you, kids church worker. <laughs> I'm always so excited to ignore your text in the middle of service.
My kids are your problem now. And good luck. My kids are crazy. No, they're crazy. Thank you, bathroom, for being the only room in the house where I get to be alone. Someone's in here. Go bother your mom. Just a few more, just a few more. Um, okay, there's a good one. Thank you, kids, for buying me a Father's Day gift I didn't want. <laughs> With my own money. Thank you. All right. What else? Thank you, Frozen and Moana, for your amazing cinematic experiences that I get to endure three million times a day. Really? Let it go. Let it go. You know the song. This will be my last thank you note. Figured I'd save the best for last. So, thank you, God, for being my heavenly father. Thank you for never walking out on me. Thank you for calling me your son. Thank you for always loving me, even when I don't deserve it. Thank you for blessing me with a beautiful wife and wonderful kids. Thank you for all you have given me. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Praise the Lord. We just want to wish you a happy Father's Day for all of the fathers that are in the house. And let me tell you, we've got like a lot of donuts left. So after the service, grab your little ones, your wife, go over there, get a bunch of donuts. Eat them up, eat them up. And also, if you haven't seen the classic car out there, that's for everybody to swing by, just take a photo, just uh, trying to have a little bit of a backdrop for you, something a little neat on Father's Day, on a special day. But uh, ladies, families, everybody swing by and uh, take a picture. Today we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture, a passage of Scripture in the book of Philippians. So you take your Bibles and turn there, and uh, we're going to be looking at a, a, a passage here that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing. He's writing a letter from Rome. He's in prison. Paul, as you know, wrote most of the New Testament. He's imprisoned in Rome because of his missionary journeys. And he's been sent to Rome. Uh, he's going to come before Caesar pretty soon. He's hoping to get released. He's hoping he's going to be released when he comes before uh, Caesar. And that he'll be able to go back out and visit all these churches that he has planted. And one of them is in the city of Philippi. That's why this book is called Philippians. It's the Philippian church in the city of Philippi. In the early days, there was only one church in each city, and uh, this was the church in uh, the city of Philippi. And so he sends them a letter because he's not able to go. He can't be released. He's not able to be released yet and because he's not able to go right now. He sends this letter back to them. So it'd be like him writing to us here at Christian Life Center. He's writing to the church. He's writing to them. He's going to say some things to them. And it really kind of seems like, uh, you know, a preacher running on. It just doesn't feel like it really has any significance. But today we're going to see a couple things that Paul 
Paul says. Now, he's a spiritual father. He's speaking about two men, Timothy and Ephroditus. And we really don't hear about Ephroditus very much. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on him today and just look at a character study of this man. These are men of God. But there's characteristics that Paul talks about that I think everyone here, every man, every father, every woman, every mother, that every single one of us can glean from, some lessons that we can learn. So look with me, Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading in verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. So turn in your Bibles, click over there uh, with me. Paul says, I hope in the Lord, the Lord Jesus, to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as, uh, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it's necessary also to send back to you Ephroditus. He's my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed. Why? Because he heard, uh, you heard that he was ill. And indeed he was ill, almost died. But God had mercy on him and did, uh, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. It's interesting here, Paul said he had anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him. Honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. Father, I thank you for this passage of scripture, for your word. We know that your word is anointed and today as we look into it, I pray that you will speak to us, that, that you will illuminate characteristics, qualities, marks of a godly man, of a godly woman, of that father that should mark us, the children of God. So use your word into our heart and our lives to grow us into your image. And all God's people said, amen and amen and amen. Like I said, at first glance, you look at this scripture and it really doesn't seem to be too deep at all. In fact, some may even ask, why is it even here in the Bible? It feels more like a personal note, you know, kind of like a preacher just running on and on talking about a few of his friends and telling a story. I try not to do that a lot, but we know that that could happen and it kind of feels like what Paul is doing. But when you look at this, and we're going to do that, we're going to dive down in, it shows us some truths that we can hold on to. You see, what Paul was doing was he was intending to send two men back to the church at Philippi. Not fancy, nothing spiritual, but he he says, I'm going to send to you Timothy, and I'm also going to send back to you Ephroditus. I'm sending him back. Now, Paul, as he tells them what he's doing, he really shows that these are two men that are role models. In fact, he says they deserve honor. Honor men like these. About Timothy, in verse 20, he says, and I love this and what he says. He says, Timothy, this young preacher, this young man, Timothy, he says, I have no one like him. Now, what a powerful, powerful statement. You can feel this bond that, that Paul has with Timothy. There's a loyalty that's there. You feel it. There's a dedication that Timothy has that Paul is commending. And he says, I have no one like him. Now, I don't know if that sticks out to you, but it stuck out to me. When you read this, here's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is saying, I have no one like him. I wonder how many of us can that really be said about us? 
not only from a pastor, but from a friend and from others, where they say, I have no one like him. I can count on him. I can count on her. That is something that is powerful when you look at uh, this. I wonder if that could be said about us, but that's what Paul is saying about Timothy. Now, Aphrodite, in Aphrodite's case, down all the way down about verse 29, where we were reading there, Paul says, welcome him, receive him back. He's your messenger. He was one of the businessmen of the church. I'll tell you uh, the story a little bit more in a moment. But he was one of the businessmen of the church. And Paul would say, welcome him back and honor him and honor men like him. So these are two guys that really were unusual. They were, uh, they were unique. And Paul was saying, follow their example, honor them. And therefore, I think it's important for us to look at this and see what made these men so special. What is it that Paul was pointing out? You see, he's not just rambling on. You're going to see that there are some qualities, some, uh, some marks, maybe is a better way of saying, or characteristics that these guys had that I think every one of us should have. Okay, as fathers, Father's Day, yes, these are marks that we should have in our family. But it goes far beyond just the fathers in the house. Every man, every mother, every woman, there's some characteristics that I think are very powerful. So let's go back. I'm only going to stay in one passage today. I'm not going to take you to several. Let's go back to verse 20. I already alluded to it. I want to read it on the screen, and I want you to underline a couple things. Look here, he says in verse 20, he says, I have no one like him. We already talked about that. I have no one else like him. Why? He's going to really show us the why is because he says, I have no one else like him who takes care of the general interest, takes care, uh, takes a general interest in your welfare for everyone else. Here's the distinction. Everyone else looks out for their own interests. So what Paul is saying is, man, Timothy is rare. Timothy is unusual. Timothy is different. And I would say not only then, but maybe even more so today. Paul says everyone else looks out for their own interests, but not Timothy. No, he has a genuine interest in you, in your welfare, what you're going through. And he says that is different. Now, when you go through the Bible and you start to look at this, you can really begin to understand what Paul is pointing out. And I'd say today, even in the world that we live in, this is huge. Because everyone else is looking out for their own interests. For me, myself, what I need, what I've got to do, my things to do, what I want, what I want to accomplish, my goals, my vision. Life is all about us. And when we come to a realization that life isn't about us, even though that's what the world is telling, that's the pull of our natural nature, when we realize that life is not about me, life is not about just my desires, my interests, it is powerful. I put two other translations in your notes. Look down in your notes there, if you will. Sometimes it's important to look at other translations because it helps you to understand the Word of God a little bit better. So look at the today. English version uh, of this verse 20 same verse it says Timothy genuinely cares for you now let me pause and say who do you genuinely care for or who genuinely cares for you in life right now 2018 well Paul says Timothy genuinely cares for you others only care about themselves in the Phillips Bible, it reads this way. In the Phillips Bible, it says, they are all wrapped up in their own affairs. Well, that's the world that we live in today. And what Paul is pointing out is the very first characteristic of a godly person, a godly man, godly woman, father, mother, and that is one who is caring. It's a character quality, the character quality of care, caring. Caring means that one is compassionate, that, that one is unselfish, that one thinks about others, but really before they think about themselves. They put the needs of others. Paul used the word, your welfare, your needs, what you need. Timothy was worried about others more than himself. 
Now, let's be honest. Again, we live in a world that's self-centered, self-focused, that we look at our needs. And this is a message for today more than ever. The fact is this, that everything in the world around us, our culture around us, is pushing you and me to be self-centered. And what Paul is saying about Timothy here is Timothy didn't seek his desires first. No, he sought others' desires first. And this is what I've learned, is when I can take my eyes off of myself, off of my needs, my desires, what I want, and I can focus on others, and I can serve others, and I can look how to minister to others, what happens is it always helps me to break materialism. It helps me to break self-centeredness, uh, living in myself, and a self-centered focus on my own life, my comfort, my my possessions, my uh, acceptance, my self-worth. If I can take all of that off and I can begin to look at how does God want to use me to serve others, I become more caring. And when I become more caring, when you become more caring, when we focus on others above ourselves, others first, me second, when I put others first, me second, God is glorified and I become more like him. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Now here's the real challenge for us, is everything is targeting you. It's targeting you to put yourself first, to pursue your ambitions, everything. Advertisement and movies and, and music and sports and video games. Everything says it's all about you. Life is about you. But here's the big headline that God would want you to see is life is not about you. Life is not about putting yourself in the center of it. You got to take yourself out of the center of your world and say, God, not only do I want you to be the center, but help me to put others into the center of my focus so that my eyes get off of myself. You see what Paul was saying, and I would say it's true today, that an unselfish man, an unselfish woman is rare. When you find an unselfish man, ladies, let me tell you, they may not look like you want them to look, but if they're an unselfish man and you're single, you better open your eyes because we're living in a world that looks on the outside and what God said, did I say something funny? But I'm serious, I'm serious. We're living in a world where God says, take a genuine interest in others. And the reality is an unselfish man and woman is so rare. Why? Because we live, we live with this pressure to put ourselves first, to put ourselves first. So my prayer in my life, in my devotions, your prayer in your life and your devotions should become more and more God Help me as a godly man, as a godly woman, as a godly father, as a godly mother. Help me, God, to be more caring. Help me to remember to open the door for my wife. Help me, Lord, to remember to look out for others' needs. Help me not to push my opinion and my wants. Help me, God, to look to what's important for you. And as I look to that, let that love, that care just flow through me. He said Timothy was like that. Secondly, what he says about Timothy in verse 22, look here, Timothy proved himself underline it he proved himself because as a son with his father he has served with me in the work of the gospel this word proved this word proved circle it underline it this word proved literally means that uh, that that timothy was tested Proved means something's been verified, it's been checked, it's determined reliable. It's been determined reliable. In the good word version, the good word version says this, you know what kind of person Timothy proved to be. Now when I heard that, I thought, wow. You see, the reality is, the Bible says, we don't judge others, they judge themselves by their own fruit. The fruit of your life will judge your life. The reality is I just see the fruit. I just see the expression of the fruit in your life. If you have the fruit of the Spirit in your life, I will see it. You know when I really see the fruit of the Spirit is when someone is under pressure, when somebody is in anxiety, when someone is backed into the corner. That's when you really see the fruit of their life. And it says that Timothy was a person that was proved, proved himself. 
tested, verified. You know what it really means is he was dependable. He was reliable. He was faithful. I don't know about you, but I want that to be said about me. He was dependable. He was faithful. He was reliable. He was trustworthy. I am a person that's not wishy-washy, up and down, flipping around, but I keep my word. I, I, I do what others won't do because it costs them too much. They see the sacrifice too great, but God, I'm serving you, and through your power and through your spirit, I can do it. In fact, it's been said the greatest ability that someone can have is dependability. Any business owner in this room will tell you that is true. The greatest ability is dependability. Your dependability will make you shine in a world that's lacking commitment, lacking faithfulness, lacking conviction, lacking character. If you're dependable and you begin to live out principles of God's word like we teach every week, these five that we'll share with you today, I'm telling you, you will shine, your life will prosper, you will find yourself in positions of influence because you will not only have the mark of God but the character of God in your life and others will see it because it's attractive let's be honest a caring person is attractive someone that's caring is attractive and you want to be around it and the second quality right here he's saying is the quality of consistent somebody that is consistent they are not up and down wishy-washy flipping all all around they're consistent consistent I think in two key areas consistent in their values what are values well values are what you believe it's what you hold on to it's been said your values is what you'll die for what will you die for what will you stand for what is it that you're so convicted about I'm telling you, I'm convicted. I've got a value that says Jesus Christ is the Lord and the King. He is my Savior, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I have a conviction that there is no way to get to the Father. And I have a conviction that as I walk with God and I trust God and I keep my eyes on God, I have a conviction in my spirit that that kind of trust in God will bring me under the shelter of the Most High and will protect my life and guide my life that this book, the book, the word of God, this book of God's word to you and I is a guide. I can trust it. I can depend on it. It relates to today. It's relevant to today. We just have to understand it today. And that's what I try to do week after week is to help you and I to know his word so that we can walk in his way. So what is it? Consistent for me is values that I am consistent with my values. And then secondly, that I am committed to God's standards. That what God says, I believe it. God said it, he's written it, and I believe it. I build my life upon it, and therefore, it becomes a priority for my life. But the struggle, and we talk about it so often, is that we live in a world. We're not to be of this world, but we live in this world, and because we live in it, this world is trying to squeeze us into a mold. It's trying to mold us and fashion our values and our commitments in our life. And so the struggle that Paul talks about is the values of this world that are contrary to the values of God. And the values of this world is trying to pull you. It's trying to shape you. And the reality is for many of you, Many of you, the reality is you're more in the, in the world's values when it comes to television and mindset and all of that, that it's growing the world's values and opinions are getting stronger and stronger and stronger in your mind and it makes you compromise the standards and the commitments of God's word. But if you'll feed your spirit, if you'll stand on the word, if you'll be a person of prayer and a person that comes and says, like you are today, I'm going to feed my spirit. I'm going to get with the people of God. Your spirit, man, will become stronger and stronger and stronger. And the more you feed your spirit, the more powerful and stronger your spirit will become. And you will be able to overcome the values of this world. So the big question is God... Am I caring? God, am I dependable? I mean, he said about Timothy again, that is one, there's none like him, there's no one else like him, I can depend on him. Now, this is the Apostle Paul. Again, powerful, 
That would be like, like a pastor. That would be like someone you highly respect. That would be like the, 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 wherever you work, the person that's running everything in your profession that looks at you and says, man, I can count on him. I can count on her. This is someone that's dependable. The more we pray this in our life, the more we ask God to develop this in our life, you will become a person of influence. I'm telling you, the more consistent and dependable you become, the more influential in the kingdom of God and in this world that we live in, you will become. And that's the greatest kind of influence we can have because light begins to influence darkness. Salt begins to come in and bring flavor to the world. And believers, you and I, begin to rise up and be the people that God has called us to be. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So the first quality that he says about Timothy is he's he's a caring man. She's a caring woman. The second thing that he says is he is consistent. He's dependable. Now he starts talking about Aphrodite in the same letter to the same church. Aphrodite, we don't hear much about. But in verse 25, he says... That he is sending Aphrodite back. He is my brother, underline that. He's a fellow worker, underline that, and a fellow soldier. So I'm sending back to you Aphrodite. They had sent Aphrodite to, to be with Paul. Now, Aphrodite was a businessman. He was a businessman from the church. Here, this is powerful. He was a businessman from the church. Paul is imprisoned 800 miles away. So he's in Rome from Philippi. Philippi's in Greece. And, 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 and Paul is in Rome. You're going to have to go across the, the Mediterranean Sea to get over there. And he's 800 miles away. He's under house arrest. So he's not in the prison that he died in. But he's in house arrest. He's got a little bit of freedom. Even though, you know, he, he is under arrest. He's waiting to see Caesar. He's having a huge impact on all of Caesar's army guards and all of that. And so the church takes up an offering. Just like we would take up an offering for a missionary and send the missionary to the mission field. They take up this offering that they're going to take through Aphrodite. He's going to be the one that takes the offering and he, he's going to stay and he's going to work with Paul. Now remember, Paul has been arrested. He's going to be executed for his faith and Aphrodite is going. Now he's a businessman. He's going to leave his business for the call of God. He felt something in his heart, in his life and, he, and he's going to take this offering. 800 miles Now, that may not mean a lot to you today because you can jump on an airplane, you know, you can jump in your car, and you can shoot off 800 miles. But he's going to go by foot, by boat, 800 miles to Rome is what he's going to do. Leave his job behind to go and do this out of the call of God that was on his heart. When he gets to Paul, we're going to see he gets deathly sick. He almost dies. The church hears about it, and they're worried about Aphrodite. He's like one of their deacons, one of their trustees. He's a faithful man among them, and he's almost died for the cause of Christ. And so Paul says, Aphrodite is my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. You sent him to take care of me. We know from another book that, um, another book of the Bible that they also took an offering. In the Good News Bible, it says, he has worked and fought by my side. Now, there's three metaphors that Paul uses right there. And I believe those three metaphors make up what the Christian family is all about, what the Christian life is all about. The first is that, a family. He says, he is a brother. He's a part of the family. We're, you know, we're we're in this. If you go back to verse 25 here in my notes, he says, my brother, Aphrodite. I mean, the, the reality is Paul is showing us that we're a family. We're a spiritual family. In fact, over 130 times in the scriptures, it talks about us being a family. That's why sometimes... I know it might seem old-fashioned, but sometimes we say brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. It's because we're a spiritual family. But you know the challenge we have today 
and especially in America church, in the American church, and I can say this, I lived overseas for 18 years working with nationalities from around the world as a missionary in Europe. And the challenge in the American church, one of the reasons we came back to America was just to be a part of what we believe God wants to do in the awakening here in America, especially in South Florida. We have a crisis in the America church, American church today, and the crisis is that we are separating ourselves from the spiritual community, that we don't see that we are a family, we're a community, we're to be connected together and gathering together and worshiping together and serving together. What's happened in the American Christianity is because of devices and, and television and social media, we think that as long as I'm developing a relationship with God, it's okay. But the problem is even though I can have a, 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 a social, uh, you know, a sermon on internet and have this relationship with God and be growing, the Bible says we grow in our Christian character when we're connected together. When the family of God walks together, it grows together. It rubs each other. Somebody will make you mad. You'll make somebody else mad. And you know what you do? You work it out. That's why Matthew 25, you're going to work it out. You're going to grow together. We grow when we rub. So when you're isolated and you click in your device and you listen to a 30-second little sermon clip or you watch a sermon, and you, you know, we think the American church mentality now has changed that we think that that is enough. And the crisis in the church today is it's not enough. Paul says we are a family. We are committed together. We're growing together and we, hit, we need one another. In fact, Paul said, he said in another book, the older women should help teach and train the younger women, the younger mothers, the older men should become spiritual fathers to the younger men that we all are a part of God's family growing together. So when we come in and we sit into a big auditorium like this, the reality is we can hear the word, we can worship together, but we need more and that is a connection with God's family. Secondly, he says not only is it a family, but he says that we worked together side by side he fought with me he was a fellow worker and that's a fellowship a fellow worker is one that's on the same mission with you a band of brothers a band of sisters you know a, a sisterhood a, a band of brothers we're on a mission together we're not just a social club we're not just a place to come and, and gather and see others from Haiti and Jamaica and other places around the world or sing songs that we like. No, 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 no. It's much more than that. We, he says, are working arm in arm, heart to heart. We're working together for a purpose, for a task, for a mission. The word I like is we're co-workers for Christ. Side by side, he said, he stood with me. He fought with me. He worked with me side by side. Now, why was that important? It's because Paul was wanting the, the, the church in Philippi to know that when he went back, when, he went, when, when, when Ephroditus got back, that Ephroditus didn't quit. He wanted the church to know he didn't give up. He finished the task. He did what he was committed to do. And yes, he got sick. He almost died, but he finished it. He worked with me. He was a brother. He was a fellow worker working side by side. We were in one accord. And can I tell you, I'm excited in what God's doing in our church and, and, and the unity and spirit across our campuses, launching new campuses and, and coming together and saying, pastor, saying with our leaders and other workers, we're committed to the mission of Christ. We're a remnant that's believing for revival in South Florida. We're believing for an outpouring and we're gonna work together. Church is not just a place to go and sit, but it's a place where I worship. It's a place where I get the mission of Christ deeper in my heart and I link together with the body of Christ to do what God has called me to do because I know I can't do it alone I need others to do it with me that's powerful when we link together like that and that's what he says is it's a fellowship a fellow worker that works side by side 
I mean, I'm reminded of one of the old theologians that said, give me a hundred men that'll commit their life, you know, commit their soul, commit everything they are, and we can turn Europe upside down. I'm telling you, you give us a church, you give us people in this church that says, pastor, I'm going to work side by side with you. Pastor, we're a family. You know, I might not like everything, but I'm committed. An usher may ask me to move out of another seat and move to another seat, but I'm not going to leave the church because that. The parking lot team may tell me to go down one aisle when I want to go this aisle, but I'm not going to let rebellion get in my spirit. I'm going to do what they ask because they're in charge of the parking lot. I'm not in charge because I'm a customer coming in the church. They're in charge. So I'm going to do that. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to go down the road. But pastor, I'm digging in with you, with the remnant of Christian Life Center that says we're going to pray. We're going to work. We're going to fast. We're going to serve. We're going to believe together that we can turn the world upside down. You see, we're not building one man's church. We're not building a denomination. We're not just building a name or a brand for Christian Life Center. We're building the kingdom of God for the glory of God, for the work of God, to accelerate his purpose. For the last number of years, I've been on a committee, a team with pastors here in the community. We call it Church United. We meet together and we're praying. We're working together to touch South Florida. We've crafted a vision, a five-year vision. And a part of that vision, and it's shocking as you hear this statistic, a part of that vision is to help because they've discovered with all of their research through Barna organization and all of these other organizations that evangelical Christian believing uh, uh, followers of Christ in South Florida equals only 3% of the population. So in all the churches, us, and in all of the churches meeting in South Florida, it represents 3% of believers in South Florida. So the vision that we have for the next five years as churches is can we move it from 3% to 6%? In the next five years, can every church... You see, it's not enough for Christian Life Center to, to win, to grow, to make an impact, and all of the other churches not. Our competition is not other churches. The competition is not that. 3% of South Florida are evangelical followers of Christ in a local church. Now, I know they may be evangelical believers not in church, but what we're counting are those that are in church because you need the local church. You can't live out God's purpose isolated and separate from the local church. So we're praying as pastors to move it from 3% to 6% in the next five years. You know what that would mean? Is every single church in South Florida would double. I mean, look around right now. Look around with me right now. Could we double in this room? Do we have enough room in this room? I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. We could easily double in this room, in this service. And you know what? I'll do 10 services a day if I have to. Pastor Nadine, listen to my voice. I will do 10 services a day if we have to. If you show up, I'm here. I'm here, I'm telling you. If you show up, people show up, we're here, we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We can double. But you know what? It's not just us. It's every church in South Florida. If it doubles in the next five years, we only went from 3% to 6%. You see, we think we're winning. We think we're making an impact. We think something's really happening. And what Paul is saying is, listen, we're a fellowship. We've got to get side by side and arm by arm. It's time to get off of the pew and get out into the harvest. Jesus says, quit talking about it. Quit praying about it. It's time to get into the harvest. The harvest is ripe. It's ready. We've got a task to do. And we've got to be the church that will do it. Can I hear amen? Amen. We've got to do it. And therefore, Paul says, it is a fight. A fight. Not a fight with one another. No, no, no. That's what a lot of you are used to is a fight with one another. <laughs> no, no, no. Remember, it's not about you. Someone wants your seat, give them your seat. Someone wants the front parking lot, get the front parking lot. Vince, maybe everybody should start parking in the back first. 
in the back first. Park to the front first. Don't park in the nice parking lot over here that's concrete. Go out into the grass so that new people that come in can get the nice concrete parking. Why? Others first. Me second. Boy, they're quiet today, Pastor Nadine. Uh, they're, they're, it's because I took my jacket off. That's why. They're, they're quiet today. They can't even get the sermon because there's no jacket on today. I don't know. But the reality is, Pence, others first. Me second. Say it, others first. Others first. Me, second. Me second. When we put others first and we see it's a spiritual fight, it's too long that the church has been fighting one another. It's too long that we come in with our attitudes and our opinions and it isolates, it divides, it separates. Jesus wants us in one accord. The book of Acts, it says they turned the world upside down and it's because they were in one accord. What does one accord mean? Is that we're linked together, side by side, heart to heart. Will we agree on everything? No, we won't agree on everything. Vince and I won't agree on everything. My wife and I definitely don't agree on everything. Nadine and I won't agree on everything. Christian and I won't agree on anything. Pastor uh, Tony, we won't agree on everything. You know, we can all, you know, have different opinions, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what color the carpet, it doesn't matter the color of the pews. At the end of the day, there are some things that we're gonna push to the side because it doesn't really matter in eternity. A hundred years from now, it won't really matter. A hundred years from now, so we've got to say what really matters today and we've got to see that there is a spiritual fight for the lostness of our community there's a spiritual fight for the brokenness of our community there are many hundreds and hundreds and thousands I would say to you today that are broken they're hurting and they're looking for believers that will rise up and be caring that will be consistent believers that will say I am going I'm going to do what God has called me to do. So this third point, he says about Ephroditus is really we've got to be in cooperation. We've got to work together. Say work together. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. Turn to another neighbor and say, you need me. We need one another. We got to work together because we're a family. We're a fellowship and we have a spiritual fight that we've got to win. Now my prayer, our pastoral team's been praying hours each week, hours together each week, that God would increase the anointing over our lives and over our church and over you specifically that we can win the spiritual fight. That you will grow the depth in your faith, that, that you'll become strong in the spirit, that you will be led by the spirit. Next week, I'm going to begin teaching you how to experience God in a worship service. When you come to a worship service, how do you experience God? We're going to teach you that. We're going to help you to understand that when you come week after week, what does God want you to do with the preaching, with the worship? How does God want you to take the points that are taken, uh, that are being presented? How do you really become what God wants you to be? So, first, is they were caring. Second, they were consistent. Thirdly, there was a cooperation. There was a unity was there. And I'm going to ask our musicians to come back for the last two points. Is fourthly, I love it, is they were considerate. He talks about Ephroditus and he talks about how Ephroditus considered their feelings. Look back with me at this verse here. I think it was in verse 26. He longs for all of you. And he is distressed, underline it, because you heard he was ill. You heard, church in Philippi, that Ephroditus was ill and he longs to see you. He goes on to say, look here, 1 Peter, yeah, right there's where I want to go. Verse 27, indeed he was ill and he almost died. He almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you couldn't give me. What does it mean to be one that is not only cooperative, but here our key point in verse 4 is that we're looking at, is he was saying this, 
This man, Ephroditus, he not only cooperated, but he was one that was consistent. He was compassionate. He was one that truly loved. He showed consideration for how others feel. Now, this is really an internal. It sounds like a simple point, but really it's powerful for all of us in our personal lives. It's to say, God, help me. Help me to be concerned about the feelings of others. Help me, God, to see what others are going through. Be thoughtful of my words and my actions. Be thoughtful about how others feel. See, a lot of times in counseling, I've heard it for years. People say, they just have to accept the way I am. You know, I say what I feel, and they're going to have to accept that. No, that's immaturity. Children say what they want to say. Teenagers spout off with the mouth without controlling. But you're mature in Christ. You don't do that. You've got to change your attitude. Someone makes you mad. I've got a right to say it. They shouldn't treat me like this. No. You surrender. You yield your right because you're a follower of Christ. No, I'm not suggesting. Hear me. Don't go wrong. I'm not suggesting that you put yourself under abuse. But I'm also saying you don't have to say everything you feel. Everything that you think, you don't have to say. That's immaturity. We learn. We learn to hold on. We learn to, to be an example. We, we say things that build up and things that exalt. The Lord's been testing me on this lately. Not just, it's not with anybody in our church. So let me say that. Not with anybody in the church. Not with my wife. Not with anybody in my church. Nobody. Nobody in the church. But there's somebody that's now come into my sphere of influence. And can I tell you, I don't think she's watching. She, I don't think she's a believer. But can I tell you that woman rubs me? I can't be, Mertz, I can't be in her presence 30 seconds. And my blood starts boiling. Honest. I'm, I mean, you guys look like you're like a bunch of like Daniels. And the lion just walked into the room, you know. I'm being honest, you know. I mean, I get there, Bill, and my blood starts boiling. She powers up. She says things. She thinks so different than how I think. And, you know, and, you know, HOA boards, how those can be. It just starts bubbling in my spirit, you know, and it's, it's bubbling me. And, boy, I walk away. I know, I know, I know. I'm supposed to be the pastor. I know, I know. But, honestly, I walk away and I say, God, help me. Help me. Help me to represent you. Doesn't mean I just roll over. No. Doesn't mean I just let him kick us around. No. Doesn't mean that you allow yourself to be abused. No. But it doesn't change who you are in Christ. And in Christ, you have a character mark. The character of Christ is in you. So what am I starting to pray is, God, help me to be more patient. Help me to hold, God. Help me. Help me to endure. Help me to turn the other cheek. Second time, God, help me turn it again. Third time, help me turn it again. Fourth time, oh God, how many times was it? Seventy times what? Seventy. A day? No, God, that's no. I have a right. She shouldn't do it. He shouldn't do it. They shouldn't treat me like that. And we get all puffed up like this. And we got to just remember that you are a representative of Christ. Christian means that you're a miniature Christ in the world. You have the character of Christ in the world. You have the attitude of Christ in the world at the work site. I know your boss may drive you nuts. I know your coworker may drive you nuts. I'm experiencing it right now. And I say, God, help me. I said to Kenny the other day, okay, I gotta go down. I gotta, I gotta go talk to her. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta see her about something. I'm on my way down. Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. I walk in. Sure enough, it happens. And what do I do? God, help me. Give me peace. Help me to say what's right. And when you do, you honor Christ. The last quality about Ephrodite, and I love it, it was a man of courage. He was fearless. I started reading it a minute ago. Let me go back to verse 27 and pick up. Yes, he was, he was, he was ill. He almost died. He almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. 
I mean, I looked at his life and I saw that, you know, he, Timothy traveled with Paul. And here Ephroditus is risking his life, not for his own benefit, but for the kingdom of God and for the glory. Oh, some people will risk for themselves. We know that. They'll climb mountains, they'll skydive, they'll surf huge waves, big deals. They'll take a risk if it's for themselves. If it's got personal profit, pleasure, if it's going to give them a rush, they'll do it for themselves. But no, Ephroditus, this guy did it for Christ. He put everything, he put everything on the line for Christ. Like I said, Paul was in prison. He leaves his job. He goes and he he takes the offering. We know that Paul says, there's bandits out there. There's robbers. I was beaten. Here he's taking an offering to Paul that would support Paul for many, many months. So you know it was a significant amount of money. He committed to finishing what he started. And I'm telling you today, that's a need. Is that we would be men of God and women of God that have courage, that are fearless. There's a group in our church, I call them the the Caleb generation. Not just our prime time seniors ministry But the Caleb generation that says, hey, pastor, I've retired. I'm not working anymore. I don't want to just sit at home and watch television, you know, and and try to fill up my day. No, the Caleb generation that says, pastor, can you use me two or three days a week? Is there some things around the church you need me to do? Maybe it's working with some of the staff. Maybe it's helping visit. Maybe it's helping another ministry. And they begin We now have five or six that do it almost full time, giving two, three, four days a week to say, God, we're gonna gonna build your kingdom. See what he said here, go back to my scripture. What he says here is he risked his life for the work of Christ. I made that bold. Brother Tony, the reason I made that bold is because it hit me last night. You see, in America, we live in a world at this time that in America, we make it easy. It's got to feel good. It's comfortable. Everything's got to be just perfect. And then we may be committed. We may come eh, once or twice a month and feel like we got enough. But Ephroditus, boy, look at him. He almost died for the work of Christ. And Candy, I thought about that. You know, in America, we're not dying for the work of Christ. But yesterday, a missionary friend of mine, I read his newsletter. And they said they just made a law, just made a law in his country. It's in India. That if you get caught evangelizing, two years imprisonment with no bail. No bail. Two years imprisonment for witnessing, trying to convert somebody to Christianity. See, the reality is we're living in a time church where the benefits that we have today, we may not always have. Believers around the world are losing their lives for the cause of Christ. And we get worried about time, temperature, whatever. And we have it so easy. And here, Ephrodite risked his life. That may not mean a lot to you, But I'm telling you, I'm saying, God, let me be a man of courage. Let us be a church of courage. You see, we live in a time that seeks comfort. And I believe what God's calling us to be is a generation that rises up to commitment. It says, I'm willing. I'm willing. Bill and Louise are over here. I love this couple. This couple has been with me. If you've not met them, if you've not been around them, they've been with me for 15 years. They served with us in Europe. They've gone all over the world with us. Bill turned 80 a couple days ago. We celebrated his 80th birthday. And all I can say is I hope and pray I have the strength that that couple has at 80. That I can keep doing and keep going. God bless them. They came out of retirement, sold businesses, retired, was a school teacher, principal, all of that. And God knocked on their door and said, are you willing to become a Caleb? Are you willing to join, in a sense, the Caleb generation? 
that says we're going to risk. The reality is we don't pay them. The church doesn't pay them. They take the retirement. Many people would look at them and say, what are you doing? They sold a dream house, 5,000 square foot dream house to move to Austria. They said, do you have a place for us to live? I said, yes. And I moved them into a little 500 square foot apartment that they had to jump on the bed to actually lay down. And Louise said, what am I doing? Why am I here? Like maybe many of us. And God said, you're fulfilling my call and you're doing what I've asked you to do. See, Ephroditus died. He, he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to advance the kingdom. My prayer is that we're going to be a church that says, God, whatever you want. That as a pastor says, congregation, this is what God's saying. We say, let's do it. It's not blind obedience, man. There's so many checks and balances in our church. It's not blind obedience. But there's a faith that says, God, we want to rise up and we want to be a generation. That it can be said they turned the world upside down. And that is my prayer for you and for me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for the anointing that's on the word of God today. And God, I know that this isn't a normal message. I know it challenges, it challenges what modern Christianity would say is acceptable. But today we see from Paul's commendations of Timothy and Ephroditus, marks of a godly man, qualities of a godly woman, models for husbands and wives and families, and most of all for a church. And I pray that we will be that. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Now in our last few moments, I don't want you to rush out because we want to have a prayer blessing over every man. So every man that's leaving is going to miss this blessing. That we're about to pray over you. We're going to bless every father. We want to bless every husband. We want to bless every man that's in this room. And we're going to ask you to come from the balcony come throughout the sanctuary, come out of the lobby, and we want to come, we want you to come around the front, and I'm going to invite everybody to stand as the worship team leads us, and I want all of our men, we feel an anointing in the room today to pray over our men, I want you to come on up, Pastor Candy, I want you to come and join me, Brother Bill, I want you to come and join me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, come, come on, me. that's right, come out of the balcony, come on out. Grab them in the lobby. Tell them, come on. Come on down. There's an anointing in this prayer today. Every young man, you need this blessing. Mama, don't take him out without him getting this blessing. Every retiree, every young adult, come on down here. Come on. That's right. Come on down. There's no wall you won't kick down. I you won't tear down. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up. Come on. Come on down. Every young man. Every young adult. Come on. We're going to pray over you.
Brother Bill, I want you to come. Brother Bill has been like a spiritual father. And as I said, he's walked with us. He has served with us. And Bill, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer of blessing over these men. Heavenly Father, what a, what a precious time together to find these principles in your scripture that we need to adhere to. To hear the message that Pastor Tom has shared with us today. We're brothers in Christ. I look across this group of men and I'm so impressed with them. They're here today, they're your men. They're committed to you. They're fathers. You've blessed them to be fathers. Responsibilities that they have to their families. Responsibilities that they have to their community. They come from different walks of life, probably. Some may be businessmen. They're workers. But all of them, all of them join together with me as brothers. That's who we are. We're, your, we're yours, God. We seek your anointing power upon our lives so that we can be what you've called us and purposed us to be. And I pray for these men. I pray a blessing upon them that their lives would be enriched from committing to you, committing their lives to you in their families, in their workplace, in the community, in our church. What a blessing to be part of this church, this family of God that we're part of. So I just pray this blessing upon them. Lord, that you would be with them, that they would walk in your way and your will for them, that they would commit themselves, that they would guard their hearts, that they would be the men that you've purposed and created them to be, to walk this, to walk this earth, and yes, to have a privilege of being able to minister in the kingdom. So I pray a blessing upon them. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now what I want you to do is, guys, I want you to link arm in arm with another guy by you. I know it seems weird, but link arm in arm. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray right now for a band of brothers. Ladies, you may want to link with the lady around you. Sisterhood. We need one another. We need one another to be what God has called us to be. That men, we would be the spiritual, spiritual head. The spiritual head was a priest. He was a prophet to the home. He was a provider and a protector. And that God would enable us to be that to our church, to our families, to our community. I want us just to begin to pray that God would unify us. Just begin to pray that God would help us to be the men, the men and the women that he's called us to be. That we would be men that love and care for one another. That we would be men that, that, that like Timothy, it would be said about us by our friends, by our church family. There's no one like him. That there's no one like him. That we're consistent, God. We're caring. That, God, we're cooperating and working together, walking in one accord. That we're going to build the kingdom together. That we see God. We see in our lives and in our hearts the need, the commitment. We make a spiritual commitment today to say we're going to be marked. Men and women that are marked with these characteristics. It's our character. It's our life. It's our integrity. It's our loyalty. That we'll be considerate of others. Not pushing our own needs and our own desires, our own ambitions and our own goals. But that, God, we will look out for the needs of others. That, God, we would be men and women that are caring. Men and women that are promoting the cause of Christ everywhere to everyone. And that we would be men of courage. Women of courage. Fearless. Standing strong for the cause of Christ. Standing for the purposes of God. That, God, we're willing to risk. We're willing to do whatever it takes to build your kingdom. Make us a remnant. Unify us. Just begin to pray for the man that you're holding right now. Just begin to lift up his name. Begin to pray for him. Begin to pray over him. That's right. Begin to pray. Begin to lift up his name. Begin to pray that, God, we would be men of courage. 
men of integrity, men of loyalty, men of commitment, dependable and faithful, that we would be young men, senior adult men, that we would be men that are marked with the gospel, marked for the cause of Christ, marked for the purpose of God, that God, we won't shrink back, we won't give up, we won't fall back, we won't yield, we won't surrender the fight, the spiritual fight for our family, for our homes, for our church, for our community. We're gonna love you. We're gonna love your word. We're gonna love the church. We're gonna love God, the work that you have asked us to do. We're going to love the Word. We're going to be men and women of the Word. We're going to be, God, what you've called us to be. God, we make a commitment today. We make a commitment, God, that we're going to be the people of God that you've called us to be. For the glory of God, for the purpose of God. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Give the Lord a praise in the house. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Now, we're going to do our closing prayer before we do. Let me tell you, there's lots of donuts. So if you've got children, mamas, daddies, get your children. Go over there and enjoy some time. Don't forget to take a picture. Everybody, take a picture out there with the 1958 classic Corvette. It is nice. It's sharp. Post it up, tag our uh, CLC social media. I want to see the pictures, and we want you to know that we love you. Fathers, we love you. We're blessing you and praying over you. Say together, say it loud. Say, Father. Say it again, Father. Help us to be the people in the church you have called us to be. People that always build up and never tear down. That always encourage and never discourage a people in a church that take a message of hope everywhere we go to every